I want to welcome you all for joining us today. My name is Charlene Margo, and I'm the proud co-founder of Nonprofit, the parent venture that brings you this presentation tonight, the Parent Education Series, now in its 16th year. We could not be more delighted to be talking tonight about parenting in a digital age, age a conversation with mental health and digital media experts. And we have with us our two very favorite experts, Dr. Dan Friedman and Jamie Nunez. So again, I'll be telling you a little bit more about them in a moment. I want to start by saying this is obviously an important and timely topic with over 480 registered. We know that this is important for you, parents, caregivers, and educators. So, so glad you can be with us again tonight. Again, we would like to give our special thanks today to Common Sense Media, Kaiser Permanente, and the Digital Wellbeing Task Force hosted by the Sequoia Union High School District. Um, and our presenters, Dr. Dan Friedman, Jamie Nunez, and we had hoped to have Jack West with us tonight, but Jack will not be available. I will be filling in for him to tell you a little bit more about the digital task force. Tonight is a webinar format. By now, most of you are probably familiar with Zoom, but there are two ways for you to interact with us. So my co-founder, Bev Hartman, will be handling the chat. Look in the chat for resource links. Feel free to ask us anything logistically, talk to one another. And then as the evening goes on, we will have a formal Q&A at the end of the program, but you can put your questions in the Q&A button anytime. So comments and resource links in the chat, questions in the Q&A. We will have about 40, 45 minutes of content tonight. I'll be speaking for a few minutes about the Digital Wellbeing Task Force. And then Dr. Dan Friedman will speak for about 15 minutes and Jamie Nunez from Common Sense Media will wrap it up with a presentation and then we will open it up to you, the audience. This presentation is being recorded and will be available shortly on our video library, which is a free resource available to parents, caregivers and educators. With close to 50,000 views, this has really become a trusted and popular resource. So do check that out. We work with the Boys and Girls Club of the Peninsula for our videography. So big shout out to Boys and Girls Club. All right, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's featured presenters. Dr. Dan Friedman earned his bachelor's degree from Vassar College and his doctoral degree from the PGSP Stanford PsyD Consortium. He completed his postdoctoral internship at the University of Texas Health Science Center and his postdoctoral residency at Kaiser Permanente Redwood City. He provides evidence-based treatment with an integrative approach. When working with children and adolescents, Dr. Friedman believes that it's important to establish a safe space for kids to talk about sensitive issues like we will be tonight, and also involving parents in their child's care. As a mental health practitioner at Kaiser Permanente Redwood City, he works with pediatricians, psychiatrists, schools, and other community partners. Thank you, Dr. Dan, for being with us tonight. Jamie Nunez is the Western Regional Manager at Common Sense Media. He supports educators, administrators, and parents in implementing digital literacy skills. For over 20 years, Jamie has redefined educational practices in the ways that students can address their online dilemmas and build daily habits into their lives. As a former high school teacher, school administrator, and academic nonprofit director, Jamie has trained thousands of educators and parents in building good digital habits. When not working, he can be found in the ocean teaching his seven-year-old daughter how to surf. <laughs> Please join me in a really warm welcome for Dr. Dan Friedman and Jamie Nunez. So I want to start out by saying that um, this event is actually the second that we have done in working with the Digital Wellbeing Task Force, which was established in 2018. So the task force had several goals. One of these was to advise school leaders on best practices as they were updating their technology plans. The other was to integrate digital citizenship curriculum into the K-12 curriculum in collaboration with feeder schools, and then to share what we learned with the parent community. So that's why we're here tonight as part of the Parent Education Series program. Jamie and Dr. Friedman, actually, this is their second time with us, so we're very grateful for their participation. In terms of partnership, this has really been a collaborative effort. School leaders, teachers, students, and parents from school districts have participated in the Digital Wellbeing Task Force alongside Sequoia Union High School District these past two years. Some of the districts, including Redwood City, 
San Carlos, Menlo Park City School District, Belmont Redwood Shore School District, and the Ravenswood School District. There have been many accomplishments to date, but I'll just highlight a few of them. One was to ensure access to high-speed internet. I believe, Jamie, you can correct me. I think that was the first focus of this task force. That, that's correct, Charlene, yeah. All right, and more than 20,000 residents in San Mateo County actually received high-speed internet as a result of their efforts. And then um, the task force has been working on a customized educational website to share monthly messaging and educational tasks across K through 12 districts. That's something that we as members of the task force have all worked on and contributed to. And one more accomplishment is tonight's event, literally the second collaboration with this organization, the Parent Education Series. We are very proud to be here with you tonight. Um, we cannot leave you without saying special thanks to our partners in this effort, Kaiser Permanente Redwood City for all of your guidance and support, particularly Dr. Dan Friedman, Stacy Wagner and Dr. Doug Balster, and then Common Sense Media and Jamie Nunez, the Bay Area Regional Director, former educator and school leader. We would not be here without you, Jamie. We know you're a very busy guy, so we are grateful for all your time. Jack West, who could not be with us tonight, but Jack has really been the fearless leader of the Digital Wellbeing Task Force. He is both a teacher at Sequoia High School and the coordinator of this program. Also, we have had um, support and help from the Sequoia Healthcare District and Dr. Karen Lee, who is the director of Healthy Schools. So Dr. Friedman, why don't you get us started? Great, thank you so much for that introduction, Charlene. Um, I'm happy to be here. Let me share my screen and some slides for all of you. So hopefully this is coming through. Um, I'm going to talk, you know, briefly about screen time and mental health in children and adolescents. And I want to be cautious right from the start to say, you know, as with anything in science, we're dealing with what we kind of know now, but things are changing. They're always changing. And um, research is definitely underway in this that isn't out yet. So we're just working with what we know now. Certainly screen time is on the rise. It's been on the rise for a long time. It has only been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic um, in, a, I mean, a stark way, clearly, the, the speed with which screen time has increased for everyone, not just kids and teens, spiked dramatically during the pandemic. There's also been an increase in mental health symptoms among kids and teens. Predates the pandemic, certainly appears to have gotten significantly worse during the pandemic. Those two things are both on the rise. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily connected, right? Um, however, some longitudinal studies, that means sort of like long-term looking over time with a, with a cohort of kids, shows that increased screen time in kids and teens is associated with a small to very small increase in depressive symptoms, okay? So, the more screen time that these kids and teens have been doing over time leads to, again, a small to very small increase in depressive symptoms. So not a huge, um, not a huge effect size, but something significant nonetheless that we can see in the data. There are some studies that seem to suggest that that relationship actually might be the reverse of what we think of it as, right? We think of kids using screen time and now they are getting more depressed. But it's possible that the kids who are developing depression are the ones who are spending more time on their devices, more time on screens, in part because they're depressed potentially, right? So the direction is, is unclear. It seems likely that some of it at least is, is that kids using screens is leading to this slight increase in depressive symptoms. However, there is absolutely no good evidence that overall increased screen time leads to, leads to significant increases in other mental health symptoms like anxiety or low self-esteem. So small to very small increase in depressive symptoms, no evidence that there's an increase in other symptoms. Now that's the big picture. 
that zooming out, that is a study looking at a lot of longitudinal studies so that we can get as much data as possible, really make broad conclusions. But if we zoom in a little bit, there was a, a recent, very recent, just came out this year, study of teens in the UK, 11,427 teens. So really, really good sample size. Make sure that we're not gonna miss anything did show that different kinds of screen time seem to lead to different outcomes, right? So that other study I was talking about was big picture. Now we're kind of zooming in. And they said social media and kind of what they call general internet use were associated with an increase in self-harming behaviors like cutting, depressive symptoms, low self-esteem, which is also associated with depression, and low life satisfaction. And this was not this, so that was particularly for those two kinds of screen time and particularly with adolescent girls, right? So there was a 166% increase in depressive symptoms, for example, in adolescent girls versus a 75% increase in boys. 75% increase still significant, but we know that girls are more likely, teen girls are more likely to have mental health symptoms. And it looks like screen time is associated with a particularly higher increase in them. The other categories that they looked at besides social media and general internet use were electronic gaming and watching TV. And it's important to note that those did not show the same effects. There's some evidence that they may lead to a little bit of an increase in those symptoms, but it's hard to draw any conclusions about it and clearly not nearly as much as social media and what they call general internet use. Um, so that's what the research tells us. What can you actually do here, right? What are we gonna do about it? So first, take a deep breath. It's always the recommended first step. And you wanna ask yourself, what is the behavior I want to see? Instead of the question we most frequently ask ourselves as parents, what behavior do I wanna stop, right? We wanna try and focus on the positives instead of dwelling on the negative. And that's hard. That's hard to do as a parent. It's hard to do as a human being, honestly, but it's hard to do as a parent. We see a problem, we see something affecting our kids negatively and we wanna change it, right? But we know from research that you're gonna have a lot more benefit, a lot more success if you can focus on what you actually wanna see your kids doing as opposed to what you want them to stop. So we don't want them to be on screens. Okay, what do we want them to be doing instead? What would be better? And then you need to model that behavior, right? Kids are hypocrisy detectors. So if you are telling them, don't be on social media, and then you're just scrolling through Facebook, they are going to notice that's gonna raise a flag for them. And it's important to note that you're not gonna be a perfect model. No one is. There's no perfect humans out there. So you wanna acknowledge your own missteps. You know, I was on my screen and I shouldn't have been, I should have been focusing on our family time at dinner. So I apologize for that and here's what I'm gonna do differently. And in doing that, you're modeling, acknowledging your own missteps, um, apologizing and coming up with a plan for how to do it differently. And that's important modeling as well. So those moments when you're caught, those are good learning opportunities too. You just have to try and you know be genuine and make the effort to change it. You wanna be consistent with your rules and boundaries. So that's always important, right? We've, we've got certain limits, we've got rules and boundaries set up, but we also need to be open and flexible. So I know that that can sound like an oxymoron. It's hard to do both. The key is that you're listening to your kids and you're maintaining a dialogue with them. Your family's not a democracy, but we don't want it to be a dictatorship either, right? Ultimately, you are gonna make, you, you and your co-parent, if you have one, are gonna make decisions about what the rules and boundaries are in your family, but there should be input and discussion with your kids. That's gonna help them get some buy-in, so again, if you have a rule about how much screen time they're supposed to have, and they have an, an argument about why that is unrealistic for them, I want you to listen to it. I want you to acknowledge that they might have a point, which can be hard to do. And we have to be willing to offer our own, you know, worthwhile parenting goal that we're trying to achieve 
with our rules and boundaries. And if you don't have one, because I said so doesn't count, right? If you don't have a worthwhile parenting goal, it's time to acknowledge that your kids may have a point and maybe this rule is not worthwhile. And important to that is being realistic, right? We are in a digital age. It is absolutely unrealistic to imagine that your um, kids are going to not be on screens, not be connected digitally. Um, that even the kinds of screen use that you may look down the most on are part of the social fabric at this point. Kids do a lot of their socializing in their video games, all right? They're playing that with their friends. They're communicating with them as they play. So you have to be realistic about what makes sense and what is attainable in, in their world. And then the last point I really want to emphasize is remembering that not all screen time is created equal, right? That's what we were talking about before. So we know that certain kinds of screen time are associated with more negative outcomes than others. Gaming and watching TV, not as much. Social media and internet use more so. That doesn't mean that we need to, you know, cut off all social media use for them either. But it does mean that you might want to do a little bit more monitoring of their social media use with their consent and with their knowledge. Don't don't be secret spies. That's not going to build trust. But with their consent and with their knowledge, then you do needing to monitor maybe their gaming, for example. And we know in particular, as we said, that girls are more susceptible to some of these problems than boys. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be monitoring your boys as well. You should. But we know from recent you know, um, revelations that have come out from whistleblowers, right, that a girl who searches on Instagram for, you know, salad recipes, the algorithm is very quickly going to start feeding her pro eating disorder content. There are dangers to that, there are dangers to social media. And so you do want to be aware of what they're seeing. What is the algorithm feeding your kids? You need to look at that. What is TikTok showing your kids? you should be aware of that. Um, you need to let them know that you're going to be looking at that ahead of time. You're not allowed to just come in all of a sudden and grab their phone and, and start scrolling through it. We want to, again, be open and have a dialogue. Um, but that may be something you want to pay attention to. OK, that's my spiel. I'm going to give up the screen. Thank you, everyone. So Dr. Dan, just quickly, we had a question come in. Could you elaborate on what you mean by general use of internet? Absolutely, yeah. So that's a question I had too when I was reading the study. Um, so basically, obviously it's nothing that has to do with watching um, TV or even uh, YouTube videos. They counted that as watching TV. Um, it's nothing to do with social media. And I think YouTube actually counts as a social media app in their, in their study as well. Um, and it is nothing to do with online gaming. It's also nothing to do with school. So they were in the study, they made sure that the teens were not including time they spend on the internet for school, but they did include time they spend on the internet for homework um, and research, basically kind of, you know, scrolling around, web surfing, if people are still doing that, that is, I think, largely what they mean by general internet usage. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dan. Yeah. We, um, I want to remind parents we're not using the raised hand, but please do put your questions in the Q&A at any time. We're going to get to them at the end of both presentations. Now I give you Jamie Nunez from Common Sense Media. Thank you, Charlene. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. I really appreciate your insights. It's like we are roommates or something. We see, speak the identical language. And uh, yeah. so if you see some similarities between Dr. Friedman and myself slides, uh, we didn't collaborate, it was just we are speaking the same language. I also want to give a quick shout out. I believe she's in attendance. Um, Stacy Wagner, amazing human being. If you have not worked with this person from Kaiser, please, uh, if you meet her on the street, please um, shake her hand or wave to her. She's a wonderful human being. So thank you, Stacy. Um, so let me kind of give you a snapshot of what we're going to do the next 20 minutes. I'm going to try to take what Dr. Freeman has shared and provide you uh, applicable steps, things that you can do starting tomorrow with your child and if at any point over the next few minutes uh, 
there are things that are confusing or the things that you're curious about or cautious about, or perhaps that's not your narrative or that's not sort of your parenting style, I encourage you to uh, raise those questions or raise those comments on the chat. All right, uh, let me share my screen and uh, we will get started. So let me, let me first kind of double down on what uh, Dr. Friedman has shared, which is uh, take a step back and breathe. It's been a really intense two plus years for many of our families on the call. And so um, I love the advice of just taking a step back and acknowledging the fact that it's really difficult for our kids as adults, uh, as parents, just to understand what's happening in the digital age. And so there's too many distractions, there's too many nuances of social media we can uh, carry on over the next hours uh, just describing what we see at Common Sense. But I just want you all to acknowledge the fact that you're doing a really great job. And if you're not, look in the mirror, drink some water, and then tell yourself you're doing it, and then uh, carry on on that. So as Dr. Freeman pointed out, and I want to kind of echo, which is I want you to think about what digital habits or qualities or behaviors you want to see in your child this week. Perhaps you're like myself, where you want to try to understand how uh, your child is taking what uh, he or she is learning online and applying it to real life. Perhaps you're trying to build communication skills at home. Uh, perhaps you're trying to mitigate um, some issues happening when your child is uh, playing video games and having a hard time transitioning away. Um, take a moment now to identify on your post-it, on your, your phone, uh, shouting this out loud, what are the habits that you are trying to create and what are you, the habits you're trying to model for your child this week? It's really important to kind of have a space to talk about and to um, a guide for you to continue um, having those conversations. View yourself know and can clearly name what those things are. I want to um, allude you to some of the research that we've done, uh, research that just came out at Common Sense. I want to give you kind of a a point about what is actually happening. Um, so again, the sample size is fairly small, but uh, we uh, interviewed or we surveyed over 1,300 students across the country, eight to 18 years old. And what we asked them is um, in our quarterly or our, our annually, I should say, census report, what we were trying to determine is um, how much time kids are actually spending uh, online. And what we've seen is, I would probably see is uh, not surprising, um, that there's been a 17% jump on average teens are spending about a little over eight hours and 39 minutes online. But what you will notice is that this is a much higher jump than what we've seen when we did this research a number of years ago. And so something to be mindful, of course, we were all in front of a device during the distance learning uh, period, but uh, this goes beyond that. We want to kind of be mindful of that. The other thing that I want to point uh, to your attention to is the types of mediums, this, the social media uh, platforms that kids were on. And one of the questions we asked is if um, students had to pick just one platform that they w could not live without, a majority of them, or 32% of them, said that YouTube as a platform would be the actual space. So know that our kids are still being passively entertained and platforms like YouTube. Uh, but we know that there's a rise in TikTok. That is not sort of the case before. So notice that uh, if you are aware of what TikTok is, I'm happy to give you a guide uh, at the end of our session. But just know that uh, for the most part, kids are still trying to look for content uh, that reinforces passive consumption. Just be aware of those spaces. So what does this all mean, Jamie? Um, as you think about what your challenges are and your pain points are, uh, what I'd want to kind of steer you to is to think about three themes that we are seeing at Common Sense. The first is rethinking about what media consumption looks like. Um, but what we are seeing now is that not, not that our kids are spending a lot of time online, but that time is often unbalanced. And so as uh, Dr. Friedman pointed out, uh, not all screen time is created equal. So if your child is editing videos, it looks entirely different ed than if they were just passively consuming TikTok videos or playing on roadblocks. So we want to be mindful of those pain points if that is actually happening in your household. And I'm going to give you some tips on how to do that. Many of our kids are reporting uh, this concept of the grind, which is uh, being exhausted, mentally exhausted from having to produce original content. So not only liking something, but also having them then produce something that is different from their peers. This is We started to kind of see this in early November when we saw a number of kids, tweens and teens, participating in online challenges. This is a way for them to produce original content, um, perhaps things that were not uh, unhealthy or, or very risky but a pain point that you should be aware of, right, moving forward. And then the final thing is just thinking about what miscommunication looks like online. When we speak to school and, and educators and administrators, one of the things that we often hear is 
Um, there has been so much miscommunication that is happening online because our kids don't know how to resolve conflicts that that is then amplified to uh, conflict happening in real life. So we want to be mindful that if your child does not have those skills or those habits built in when they are in front of a screen, we want to be mindful of uh, course correcting and being able to teach your child how to communicate when they're feeling frustrated, um, how to how to resolve dilemmas when they perhaps are unaware of what uh, resolution looks like. So here's your kind of call to action. First and foremost, think about in your own family, what are your pain points? What are the things that you all are grappling with that your child is grappling with? I saw in the commenter, I think on the question, I'm, I'm having a really hard time uh, monitoring my child um, as he or she is uh, on his phone while they're doing homework. So for, for that particular call, for that sort of like question, I might sort of ask, um, is your habit or is your behavior that you'd like to see um, your child doing unconcentrated work, meaning that they wanna focus in on one particular task? And if that's the case, then we wanna be able to teach them that, right? So if the pain point is your child gets easily distracted or multitask that, that then takes them a long time to complete a particular task or an activity, then we wanna be able to name that as a particular pain point. Um, so take a moment now to think about the pain points and and uh, and don't sort of um, outline so many pain points that we'll just make this conversation really difficult, but just identify one or two that uh, you might be grappling with. And if you're saying, I don't have any pain points, give me your cell phone number and your uh, address and I'll send my six-year-old uh, over to, to your house uh, for you. Just kidding, but uh, I, kudos to you for that. Um, all right, as I pointed out, we want to kind of ensure that uh, we're building these habits for our kids, uh, name that. And then um, the first thing I want to the first thing I'm going to do for you all is in terms of giving you some applicable tips is to provide you with um, some knowledge, meaning um, things that you can do today to just uh, understand the platforms that your child is in. Um, so what we have at Common Sense are a parents' ultimate guide on a number of uh, tools or platforms. These are one minute quick overview tips and videos that you can share. You can uh, educate yourself on prior to observing what your students or your child is actually doing online. Let me give you one really quick example, just so you are aware of that. I'm gonna stop my screen just for a second and then share it one more time, but share the sound, all right? Parents may not know about the popular social image sharing platform, Instagram. Number one, according to the terms of service, kids should be 13 years old before signing up. Unfortunately, Instagram has no age verification process, so lots of kids younger than that are using it. Number two, some users have multiple <laughs> accounts that are completely separate from each other. Fake Instagram accounts are public facing and highly curated and project an ideal online persona that's hard to achieve in reality. Number three, depending on whom you follow or what you search for, you can find lots of mature content on Instagram. Whether it's cyberbullying or oversharing, Comments on posts can be downright vicious, especially if an account is public. Number four, Instagram accounts are public by default, so the first setting to change is the privacy setting. With a private account, only people you approve can see what you post. Number five, using Instagram might affect a teen's body image and sense of self. The pressure to look perfect or to get the most likes and followers means some teens will be comparing themselves to others. And number six, Instagram is also a place kids can be creative, posting art, poetry, and videos that showcase their talents. So when used purposefully and in balance with other activities, the app can leave kids feeling connected and positive. For more- So you can kind of see here really quickly, what we do is we just uh, highlight what's happening on the application. So if you yourself are unaware and unfamiliar with a number of apps, I encourage you to go on our ultimate guide. Again, this is uh, free resources for you all. On that and I will post that on the chat and we'll share that uh, Charlene will share that uh, by the end of the evening um, so what I want to close with is things that you can practically do um, tomorrow and as you think about changing your your narrative your sort of disposition as a parent and the three things I want to sort of um, ask you to do and encourage you to do and even invite you to do is this uh, there's a process to all of this when you think about addressing some of these issues with your child the first process is actually being very intentional about observing um, your child's mannerisms online. So if they're very impulsive when they're using um, a device, we want to be able to take a step back so we don't entertain and, and engage in conflicts with your child, right? They might be doing and might be thinking about a number of things 
um, with socialization, with befriending someone, with um, resolving a conflict. And so the first conversation, the first kind of way in which you can observe that is simply by asking really thoughtful questions, right? things like, um, hey, uh, Charlene or Dr. Friedman or Dan, um, what did you see online today that really made you upset? Or what are the things that made you really excited online? And what you're doing is you're taking a step back and just observing how your child is engaging on the platform. You can s simply replace the online to the game. Hey, what, ha what happened in that game over the last 30 minutes that made you feel excited? Or what is it the thing that you're learning about in these spaces? And try as much as you can to practice this, this the tone of acceptance and observation. Right? And so what I mean by that is you want to really suspend any judgment that you have about what your child is doing, unless you have a problem with it, right? You want to make sure that we're modeling and, and expect and sharing with your, with your child what you expect from them. The second is making sure that you are talking about and addressing ways your kids are um, resolving dilemmas or arguments online. And what I mean by that is being able to insert um, your expectations around what conflict resolution looks like and realize and know that sometimes kids don't have the words or even the thoughts to, um, to communicate that online. And so what you wanna to try to do is first ask, how do they solve dilemmas? And second is practice with them, right? So when my, your father and I, or when your aunt and I have this argument, this is what we often do. Um, and so we want to really, as much as we can, not only try to model this, but try to make this part of the conversation narrative that you engage with online. And then finally, I, I want to encourage you all is to just affirm your child. There are many things that your child is doing online. There are many challenges and um, shifts your child is thinking about when they're exposed to things online. We want to make sure that we affirm when something is going really well. Like, you know, doc, uh, Dr. Friedman, what I really liked about the end of your presentation is you're really welcoming and I really liked your tone and I really appreciate that you smiled at the very end of your presentation, right? And so all of a sudden, Dr. Friedman feels really good about it. I actually really mean that, Dr. Friedman, but these are things, subtle things that you can start to model for your child. All right, so I want you to pause for a second and I want you to think about what you're gonna say to your child today or what part of the conversation uh, you want to uh, try to work on between now and the end of um, the week. All right, and if you're already really good at this, again, please note your contact information so we can start creating babysitting services. Uh, the final piece that I wanna kind of hit on and, and gloss over or um, address is uh, thinking about how uh, social and emotional skills are connected into your conversations. And I'm gonna give uh, a few examples so you are aware of what, what I mean by this. In school, SEL or social and emotional skills seem to be a big topic, right? How are the kids feel? about what they're learning and what it actually does for their overall well-being. At Common Sense, we've identified and we partnered with uh, the organization Castle that uh, and helped it sort of draft or helped to create these uh, five skill sets or they have these five skill sets. And what, what I encourage you to think about is how your conversation or conversations at home lead to having thoughts and having uh, reinforcing these particular um, topics or these themes. And let me give you a quick example just so you are um, aware of that. So this is a sixth and eighth grade family conversation um, starter that we have, and I'll post this on the chat as well, share this. Um, and this is a conversation with, that we've outlined that parents can actually have that talk to their child about media balance. And so if you find that in your household that your child is spending way too much time on their video game or curating their TikTok account or playing roadblocks in a particular way, one of the things you could encourage them and one of the things you can be talking about is the habits that they've created um, prior to going online and habits they're creating uh, to make them feel positive or make them feel uh, alive or a transition into something that's beneficial for them after they're online. So what I'm gonna encourage you to think about is taking some of these conversations and thinking about what skills you wanna uh, help to reinforce. In this case, this is a skill around self-management uh, Dr. Friedman, I shouldn't be asking you 10 minutes to get offline. I'm going to ask you to set a timer, and then we're going to have a conversation as to whether or not that worked. And if it didn't work, what can we do better next time we're in? It sounds very rudimentary, but our kids need these skills in order to self-regulate, in order to feel alive in, in their presence, right? So in order to uh, combat some of those algorithms, combat some of those changes they have. All right, the final thing I'll kind of go on and sort of the practice that I'll encourage you all to think about uh, tomorrow is this. Um, 
when you're in front of your child's device the next time, I want you to think about and observe your child's identity um, online. So if they're playing a game, take a step back and see what it gets them irritated, what, what they get excited about. And then at that point, once you've done your observation and enough observations, I want you to set some expectations. And those expectations are what you what you want from them, the behaviors, the habits that you want them to create. The Dr. Friedman talked about that. I want you to also then practice um, in your household what it means to navigate tricky situations. And so my child this past week talked about wanting to watch another movie at 8.30 at night before she was going to bed. And she, as much as she could, um, she tried to tell us and she tried to explain that watching another movie was really helpful for her to dream better. And I thought, wow, this is a great conversation to have to, with a six-year-old. And what I ended up realizing is that she wanted to have conversations with her friends at school to then, uh, she wanted to have, watch films that she can then relate to her friends at school with. And that it was really difficult sometimes to talk about what other kids were talking about in the playground because she doesn't have enough tech time to, to observe and to discuss that. So what we ended up talking about is how she can have conversations about things happening online where she doesn't have to engage with the actual online platform. So you kind of see a little bit of how this thing could actually play out when you start asking these questions. And then the final thing for many of you that um, have really good friendships and great collaborations with your child's uh, parents, Take a moment to collaborate with them and think about what norms you can create collectively, things that you can actually help to support um, one another with when your friends or when your child is hanging out with his or her own friends online. If you can do all that, then you're amazing. Uh, but with that, I'll leave you uh, to take any questions and uh, we'll go from there. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dan Freeman and Jamie Nunez. That was really wonderful. Lots to think about, lots of great questions coming in. We really appreciate that you both emphasize the need to be open and flexible and communicate with your children. So parents, I think if nothing else, please do take away those items. I loved also, Dan, that you suggested that people actually listen to their kids. And if they make good arguments, sometimes change your mind. That's really great advice too. All right, let's get right to it. You know, as, as Bev and I say, no matter what the topic, whether it's mental health or compassion or substance use, we always end up talking about video games. So let's do it. Um, parent says here, why do you say gaming causes no harm? My 14 year old son literally wants to play internet games 24 seven. So I wanna be clear. I'm not saying that internet gaming causes no harm. Okay. Um, I'm saying that the research is really unclear. We can't make a definitive statement looking broadly about any effects that internet gaming has like across the population. But your son may be having a serious issue with internet gaming himself. I mean, that's, um, that is definitely a possibility. There is a lot of research going on into the idea that some internet, um, internet gaming is um, behaviorally addictive in the same way that gambling can be. And certainly game designers use the same kinds of techniques that people who design slot machines use to keep you going, keep you clicking, right? Just one more click and I'm gonna get the reward. So there are, it is possible that people could have a kind of behavioral addiction to internet gaming. If that is a concern that you have, you wanna, talk to your child's doctor, talk to a mental health professional about that particular issue, for sure. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dan. What do you think about schools? Should schools do more limiting use of technology? Parent says, I wish they wouldn't allow cell phones at school. On the other hand, I like my kid having a phone so I can reach them for appointments and sports and pickup and so on. Anybody? I'll take a stab at it, Dr. Freeman. Um, here's what I would suggest as a parent. One is being extremely clear with your child's, uh, with your child's teacher and the school to communicate what tech tools are being used in the classroom, how often, and what the purpose is for. Is it to complement or supplement uh, learning? Is it to uh, ensure that kids are having a break time, mental break time, or gaming time? Um, I'd be really clear about what's actually happening there. With respect to phones, um, I'd be very clear about how what uh, 
what the cell phone policy is and um, where you can communicate with your child if you need to get in touch with them, right? The, it's really difficult to create policies. Again, as a former administrator, it's really difficult to both uh, monitor what's, what kids are doing online and ensure that families have a space to communicate with their child. Um, as a parent, what I would sort of suggest is to, uh, to, to communicate often with your child's teacher, with your administration or your school's administration to say, this is how I communicate with my child. And then to set those expectations, if indeed you're communicating with your child uh, during the, the school day. But I think in general, to answer that question, it would be, we need to not take a step back from technology, but we need to be able to make in te uh, technology very intentional for learning if indeed it's happening at, uh, on school campuses. So great right. question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jamie. So I think this one is for you, Dr. Dan Friedman. Um, you mentioned that parents should not be secret spies. What do you think about tracking software? As a parent, it's very tempting to put one of those little Apple devices in the car or in their backpack. Why should parents not be secret spies? So um, first of all, I would say about those Apple tracking devices, there's, I mean, I haven't done any particular research into it, but I've read some concerning articles about people abusing those things. Um, so I would be careful with that in particular, but in general, why should parents not be secret spies? Because you wanna have a trusting relationship with your kids and trust goes both ways. I mean, if you don't trust your children, then that's something that you need to talk about with your co-parent, talk about with your kids. But when you are spying on them, they have every good reason to then not trust you. And I can virtually guarantee you that they are going to figure it out eventually. There is nothing, there is no spy software, no tracking method that you have that is so perfect that they're never going to figure it out. They are going to figure it out. And understandably, they are going to be mad at you. And they are then not going to trust you and come to you when they have a serious problem. And that can lead to a lot more problems for you down the road you are going to get much, much further with them if you are honest and open with them. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be having monitoring software, for example. I think you should let them know that you're going to have monitoring software, though, and talk to them about what that means. Now, kids are technologically savvy, and I'm sure that you know there's some concern out there. Well, if I tell them that I'm doing the monitoring software, they're going to find a way around it. That's possible. And you need to be clear with them that if they do that kind of thing, then they are violating your trust in turn, right? It's about building trust with them. That's the most important thing. I hope that answers your question. I just want to quickly oh, add that. Can I, Charlene? Yeah. yeah. I think there is uh, so a few things, right? If so, if you're on the call today and you are grappling, if you are under the, if your child is secretive, meaning they are not allowing you to kind of verify kind of the information to connect on uh, with what's happening online. Then we need to reset those expectations with our kids, right? And you need to be very clear with them that in, in your household, these are the things that happen, right? Not that you want to then spy on everything that they're doing because there might be other issues, relationship issues, perhaps they're dating someone, perhaps they're grappling with, with a friend that they don't want to communicate with you on. But it should be that, they sh that relationship around digital technology should be very transparent. And if it's not, it might be time to reset that expectation, right? It might be time to grab that phone and say, this is what's happening in our household because I am the parent, right? It's, it's, uh, it's not a power dynamic here. It's just, it's the dynamic based on uh, trust as Dr. Friedman said, right? That's well said, Jamie, thank you. And you know, I always think about our friend, um, Dr. Devorah Heitner, founder of Raising Digital Natives, who says, remember if you use that kind of tracking software and you find something and you haven't told your kid, then what, right? Then you've broken trust. And Jamie, I love your suggestion to really talk with your kids about what they're doing on social media rather than necessarily using it, but to really have it as part of a conversation. I thought that was a great point. Okay, here we go. A parent says, my child lacks self-control and has difficulty transitioning between focusing on homework and taking a 10 minute break to watch something. Any advice? <laughs> Jamie addressed it in his presentation, didn't he? That was perfect, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, saying get off the device in 10 minutes, what does that mean? And how are they going to know when 10 minutes are up? 
we want to be clear with them ahead of time about how much time they have on things and set timers and set those expectations um, and also recognize that some of its um, temperament, which isn't going to change, or some people struggle more with transitions than other people, kids, teens, adults, and it may not have anything necessarily to do with their technology usage and may just be people who struggle with transitions. And then if you are that sort of person or your teen is that sort of person, your kids, that sort of person, then you need to offer more support and structure for them, right? Lots of timers, lots of ways for them, lots of repeated, you know, notifications hey you've got this much time left this is this is what you have left before the transition to something else but it's hard for all of us to transition from a preferred activity to a less preferred activity let's also normalize that right i mean that's that's not inherently a problem with your kid that's all of us who wants to go from you know having breakfast to going to work in the morning that's not fun either right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have children who are young adults, and I find in the time since they were teenagers, I'm more distractible. I'm sure that the kids and the parents, we are all more distractible than we used to be. Yeah. Um, all right. So this is kind of a basic question, and it comes up. So we'll just put it out there. Is there some age that you recommend that you give a child a cell phone that has internet? Do you recommend they start with just texting? Jamie, you have a little one. What do you say? That's a great question. We get asked that all the time. And uh, common sense, you know, the three areas that I think I might sort of suggest for that uh, person asking that question is, uh, number one, have you established the norms of uh, privacy, like how information is kept private in our household or what information that we share with others online? Um, two, have we established ways in which we communicate as a family? Um, and the medium of technology is just another sort of channel to communicate, but have we established what those norms are? And then the final thing is, have we established and have we practiced um, what to, what we do when we feel uncomfortable using any device, right? So if your child has played a game before and there's been an advertisement that makes everyone feel uncomfortable, do you pause and say what, what that was or not? And what I would sort of suggest with that is that there is not a, a right or wrong age. I would suggest that when your child is developmentally uh, ready to talk about and discuss that, what I would first ask you to do is try it out, try testing text messaging, communication online, and then see if you can actually expand that, right? So this next sort of phone that we give you, we expect these three things happening, um, but don't give in to the pressures of family or their friends. And if you feel that way, then take a step back and say, have we established the things that I've just spoken about? So. Thank you, Jamie, great advice. So in that sort of line around privacy and age and what is okay, parent asks, what do you do if, your son, this is her son does not have a cell phone, but some of his friends do, and they sometimes record him. What should he do about that? How does he protect himself? Uh, well, I mean, I think, first of all, you want to be having an open conversation with those other kids' parents about their, you know, their kids' phone usage and what you're comfortable with and why. You want to sort of ask yourself and have your kid share what about being recorded is making them uncomfortable. I can think of all sorts of reasons you might be uncomfortable about it, but you want to make sure that you have your own reasons laid out before you talk to other parents um, and try to approach them in a way that's not going to make them very defensive, right? So just, you know, hey, we have these concerns. Is it possible for you to talk to your child about it? Have, you know, arm your child with those same talking points to be able to advocate for themselves to their friends. You know, I don't really want to be recorded on your phone today. Of course, this depends on age and maturity level, all sorts of stuff like that. But ultimately, the truth is you can't control other people and you certainly can't control other people's kids, right? And um, if they continue to do this and it's a serious problem for you or your kid, then you have to ask yourself, what is, you know, what's going on with this relationship and where is it worth it? If it's happening at school, you can certainly talk to teachers and school administrators about it as a problem, but, you know, ultimately there's only so much you have control over. I don't know, would you add anything to that, Jamie? Spot on, Dr. Freeman. I think uh, scripting is really helpful, right? So I'd take out your phone and I'd record uh, your child and role play kind of what that might actually look like and then practice what those narratives, what that frustration might look like for your child. And as, as Dr. Freeman pointed out, I think it's really helpful to help the child like build in language 
for why that upsets them. It may not resolve the issue, but it at least helps them to sort of uh, feel empowered by the words and the tones that they're using. Um, if they have someone, a trusted adult, that can kind of help them navigate these situations in the moment. So, so both of you cited research great research around screens and kids and especially girls and the impact on mental health and self-esteem. Parents are still asking about video games. So Dr. Dan, what are you seeing in your practice? Parent asks in terms of boys, nine to 10, 11 to 13. Um, what are you actually seeing in the Bay Area with regard to video game playing? Still a big worry for parents. Sure. I mean, I hear a lot about video game playing from parents and um, I will. So in my own practice here in the Bay Area, not based on any research that I've conducted or anything like that, um, it's true that I think it's more boys than girls, but it's definitely both. So I don't want to pretend like girls are not playing video games. Video games are broadly popular. Um, I think that there have been a handful of kids that I have met that I think are probably addicted to video games, which is not something I can actually diagnose. It is not an official diagnosis yet because there's not enough research yet to support that as an official diagnosis. But that I suspect are, are actually addicted to video games. And there are many, many, many more kids whose parents suspect they're addicted to video games. Right. But addiction is a very specific thing that we're we're talking about. Right. It is um, when you feel a need, a compulsion to do something, um, despite knowing that it has negative impacts on your life, when you develop a tolerance to it. So you need more and more to feel good. And when you have withdrawal symptoms. So if you stop. Right. There's problems for you there. And we see that with. For example, gambling. Gambling meets all of those requirements. It is not 100% clear that video games meet those requirements. As I say, there's a handful of kids I think that I've met that do. Um, you know, if it's addictive behavior, then you're going to need to, in some ways, treat the child like an, an addict and cut off the supply where reasonable. The difficulty here is that it's a bit like if someone's addicted to food at this point. We, can't, we cannot deprive children of the internet completely. In the same way that if we said someone was addicted to food, we can't now cut them off from food. They need that to survive, right? As opposed to drugs, we can say, well, they don't need that drug to survive. We can deny them access to that drug entirely and it will be better for them. We cannot deny them access to the internet entirely. That's just not realistic. They need it for school. They need it for navigating the world after school. This is not something that we can deprive them of. So it's about setting up restrictions that make sense um, in your family. Um, you want to be working with a professional on that. I mean, I just, if you really suspect that your child is addicted to video games, I encourage you to talk to a mental health professional about it. I don't think this is something that you want to be tackling on your own. But I just want to be cautious that the vast majority of you who think your child is addicted to video games, they're not really, they just really like playing video games, which is different. And some consistent, healthy boundaries and rules around it and expectations is going to be really useful. Again, focusing on what it is you want to see, why this is the parent, why this is a parenting concern for you, having real reasons to say, I notice that when you are playing these video games, it's affecting your school, it's affecting your social life, it's affecting you in these specific ways so that you can talk to them about it and have an open conversation. Thank you, Dr. Dan. I would also refer you parents to a video on our video library from Dr. Anna Lemke. She's a Stanford psychiatrist. The video is The Neuroscience of Addiction, and she touches on video game playing. Highly recommend that video has had more than 7,000 views, so go check that out. So we're getting some questions really about limit setting in teens and privacy. How, do you feel that, and again, we have so many great questions coming in. I really wanna give you time for some final words, but one quick question. What do you both say about taking away a teen's phone as a form of discipline? I have an opinion, I wanna know what you two think. Charlene, I would love to hear your opinion as a wonderful <laughs> mother. <laughs> Um, I, I think it, it 
so here are a few things that if you've established a set of norms or expectation, your child has broken that. And again, I want to put on my educator cap or administrative cap. I think there's fair consequences um, to not only taking away your child's phone, but to letting them know what your intentions are uh, when you've taken that away. Right. So we want to communicate that, like, you know, if you don't take out the trash, then I'm taking away your phone. That is a completely different narrative than here are the expectations that we set around communicating with someone online and you've broken that trust and you've broken that communication about what we expected. So as a result of that, you are not ready to handle such a powerful device, right? Really clear cut. And at this point, we're going to give this back to you when you can um, let us know that you can do this. Now what is know that your child is developmentally still growing and may not understand that. And so we need to accept the fact that our child are, are, are going to be making mistakes. So, uh, to answer that question, I think it's perfectly acceptable. I just think that we want to be extremely clear about the why and uh, realize that your child's uh, social life may suffer because of the experiences of that and that they know how to deal and navigate that those experiences, right? Wonderful, great question. Really well said, Jamie. And it goes back to Dr. Dan, what you said about being open, flexible with your kids. Absolutes in terms of boundaries seldom work around technology, although I know parents dearly want to try them. They don't tend to work in the long run. All right, we have just a few minutes left together and so many great questions coming in tonight. I wish we could answer them all, but I want to give each of you a chance to really give us some final thoughts and in terms of technology and coming out hopefully of this pandemic, what gives you hope? And what makes you think that we're going to get better at navigating kids and technology? Dr. Dan, I'm going to hand that to you. Thank you, Charlene. Um, I think that um, your children are digital natives in a way that I know I wasn't. I assume most of us probably were not. The, the environment is changing. And I do think that um, they give me a lot of hope for their understanding of that world. When I work with these kids, I mean, it's true. Some of them have issues with, you know, managing their time on the internet, managing their technology usage. They're also kids and they have difficulty managing their uh, ability to withhold from anything they enjoy, right? If you give them a bag of marshmallows, are they eating one marshmallow or are they gonna eat the whole bag, even though it's gonna make them feel sick? And that's also true of a lot of us adults too, right? Some of us have difficulty with that as well. So that's nothing new. It's just that this kind of technology that people are engaging in is new. But I do think that a lot of the teens that I work with um, have a really profound insight into the effect that this is having on them. I think that they can be aware of it. I think that your kids are capable of that in a way that may not always be evident when they're talking with you because they're locked in a power struggle with you, right? So if I can give you one takeaway, it's get rid of the power struggle, right? Work with them, not, not against them. Um, you, the two of you can sit down and solve this problem together if we reset the relationship. Focusing on those positive aspects of your relationship with your child, I'm sure they are still there. And, and again, focusing on what it is you want to see because that's going to be part of that positive relationship. And then you are going to find, I believe, when you do that, that they are going to have more insight for you and more buy-in into working on this. So that's my my hopeful message. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Those were great ones. Jamie, common sense. Going to let you have the last word here. Uh, we've shared a lot. And if you're feeling like you just want to faint, so um, <laughs> drink some water and enjoy. But just know that you are all amazing. I'm not some like guru that's just spewing out positive and affirmations to you. I think you all know that you've established some really great relationship with your child. And, and I want you to lean into that a little bit, be able to kind of understand and identify your own strengths as a parent. That's like the biggest takeaway at this point, right? You have a really great strength, just reinforce that. And if it's not going as well as you'd like, reset that. And I think the two other points that I just really want to quickly share is, one is understand the nuance of play in digital media, that your child is really looking for opportunities to play and engage in other spaces. What we want to try to do is to ensure that you, when your child is playing or engaging in these spaces, that they're safe, 
that they reinforce the values that you've established as a family member and that they can report back to you when they're not online. And then the second thing that I want you to encourage, I want you to uh, think about is think about what your child, um, as your child is on um, social media platforms or online, think about how you can then amplify their positive contributions in real life. Praise them, connect with them, let them know what they're doing really well when they're doing that. Thank you for putting your phone away at the very end of the night and not having a conversation about it. Thank you so much for saying that really positive comment over text message. So just be able to practice some of those skills. Our kids at this point really need those affirmations. So you all got this. I, 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 I believe in you all. Thank you, Jamie. That makes my child development heart happy. We used to say with little kids, catch them doing good, right? And I think it's really the same whether they're four or 14. So again, a huge thank to Dr. Dan Friedman from Kaiser Permanente and Jamie Nunez from Common Sense Media. We wish we could have gotten to everybody's questions, but it was a wonderful evening and we really appreciate you both. So thanks again for coming and we hope to see you again soon. Take care, everybody. Good night. Stay well. Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Charlene. Take care, Dr. Friedman.